So we we'll have for the cafe view, okay, to give the seminar. Okay. Yeah, Professor Liu, okay, is a very uh, famous okay nuclear theorist and also uh, working on using the last QCD okay to tackle the nuclear physics problem. Okay. So he's the best nuclear theorist I ever know. Um, How many do you know? <laughs> <laughs> you are the only. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, well, as far as I know, okay, I do not know other nuclear theorists. Okay, tackle the problem from from the from the first principle. Okay. That's yeah, the same thing I always tell my daughter. I want one daughter, one son. The best daughter, the best daughter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the others may be using models or yeah, so so. Well, uh, Professor Liu, okay, uh, got his uh, bachelor degree, okay, with the highest honor from Donghai University, okay, in 1968, and he uh, received his uh, PhD from Stony Brook uh, in 1975, and then he went to Sakai as a postdoc from 1974 to 1976, okay, and then uh, moved to uh, UCLA in 1976, and then stayed there. Uh, to 1979 and then was appointed as the adjunct assistant professor uh, from 1979 to 1980. And then he was uh, appointed as the associate professor okay, at the University of uh, Kentucky. Okay. And he promoted to the full professor in 1986. Okay. So, um, yeah, so it's a very yeah, outstanding career. <laughs> uh, yeah, Kirby also received uh, a lot of honors and awards, okay, including the Humble Awards for Senior Scientists in 1990, okay, and also the uh, APS Fellow, okay, uh, and also the University Research Professor at the University of Kentucky, okay. Yeah, besides the academic work, okay, Curve also uh, did a lot of service to our community, including uh, serving as a president of the Overseas Chinese uh, Physics Association, the president, okay, uh, from 2003 to 2004, okay, so yeah, so we are very happy to have Cafe give the seminar, and we have the title, uh, Strangeness, Charmness, and Photon uh, Spin Components, let's welcome for the Thank you for such a flattery uh, introduction, I'm sorry, I don't know, but I deserve that. But anyway, I'll very happy uh, to be here, visiting actually for three months. Uh, so, um, oh, I'm visiting uh, Tim Wayne. I so, you it's okay. So, if you have any questions or anything that you want to talk about, uh, we see issues and others, uh, I'll be very happy to discuss with you. My office is in uh, room 708. Uh, you can come anytime. Um, you don't have to make an appointment with me. I'll be happy to. Uh, I'll report on the, our recent studies of strangeness, charmness, and the proton spin components from Lattice QCD. <clears throat> First, I'll talk about strangeness and charmness, and then find out where the spin of the proton come from. Okay? I'll give you a status of that, and then teach you what operators we use for the calculation, and using the sum rules for normalizations, and then finally, the lattice calculation that we have. And this is the collaboration members who have more members than this, but these are the people involved in these projects. <clears throat> now, first of all, let me show you the, the relevance of strangeness and, and charmness, and people have a great interest in this, uh, mainly because of the search for dark matter. Right? Everything that's popular is related to dark matter search. In this particular case, the one of the popular uh, candidate, the neutrino, the ne ne neutralino, various neutralino can, uh, candidates can couple uh, through the Higgs to the nuclei as a detector. Okay, so you need to know the coupling of Higgs coupling to, um, to nuclei. Of course, in that we know it's coupled to the QQ bar and multiplied by the quark mass. Therefore, fundamentally, you would like to know the matrix element of the QQ bar condensate in the nuclei and multiplied by the quark mass. Right? And divide it, because people use this uh, dimensionless quantity by dividing that by nuclear mass. So for heavy quark, it's this. Turns out, of all the quark flavors, the UDs are well known. You have a pi nuclear sigma term. It's 
40 some MeV is well known. And it turns out the heavy quark people have estimated through the heavy quark expansion and also the trace anomaly of the nuclei to estimate how large this one is. This is, turns out to be the least known quantity. And, and from the, this is the only way that we know is to calculate that from the lattice because the quark mass is so heavy, the k out nuclear scattering, you cannot get the from chaos nuclear scattering. It's very far from uh, so-called Chen Dashian uh, Dashi points. So it's hard to extract that from chaos nuclear scattering. The only reliable way is lattice. However, the previous lattice calculations using power fermions is plagued with a lot of troubles. Because when you calculate, because the Wilson fermion does not have chiral symmetry, it has a residual mass. When you calculate this change, you can mix with other flavors, particularly UD. And UD has connected insertions, and that makes that insertion has large subtractions. That makes it so using um, this thing, uh, Wilson type fermions, which does not have chiral symmetry, is problematic. Therefore, the solution, one of the best ways to do it, is using chiral fermion, which has chiral symmetry. It doesn't have this mixture, and uh, in the normalization group, you have a normalization group in varying quantity to calculate, and you don't need to normalize it. It's a straightforward calculation. <coughs> However, it can be expensive. The thing is that we're doing the overlap fermions on domain wall fermions using the uh, domain wall fermion gauge configuration. And that's what uh, any questions you can ask uh, uh, the world expert who's sitting here. It's our chair. Now, so that's why we choose this thing here. The reason we have, there are many dynamical domain wall fermion configurations already available. I'll show you in the next slide. From the RBC, this is Recam, Brookhaven, and Columbia, and UKQCD from the United Kingdom. Uh, and the lowest pile mass is already reached to the physical one, and with a very fairly big size, 5.5 fermion. We use overlap fermions on these, as a valence on this, so that he has a good overlap, uh, it has better power symmetry than this one even. Even this is good enough, but, but this one is still better. And we'll calculate quark loops, as I explained, from the low mode averaging and improved nuclear propagators with calculations. Okay. So first, let me show you the, the set of lattices that are available um, today, almost. Okay? Now, these are the three earlier set of lattices. These two have a small boxes, three Fermi, the, pile, the lowest power mass is uh, 300 MeV. And this one is um, 4.5 Fermi, it's pretty big. And the power mass is close to the uh, uh, physical power mass at 140 MeV. So we are working at this stage at these three lattices. Okay? So from this three lattices, you can do three lattice phase and you can do uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, power uh, the, uh, the continuum extrapolations. And with this three masses and so on, you can do a power extrapolation. And these are uh, the one that I'm going to report the results on is, is based on this. I'm currently working on the other two. Now, when that's finished, we would like to move on to this one. This is a really big lattice, 48 cubed by 64. Right? This is a huge lattice, and furthermore, the overlap in general is two orders of magnitude more expensive than Wilson fermion. Right? So that's why people, many people choose to use Wilson fermion or even stagger fermion, but they have many problems with these. So, uh, We'd rather spend the really the hard time to get it right. Otherwise, you have systematic errors which you don't know how to control. So lattice is something like doing an experiment. All right? If you don't know, know your systematics, then it's hard to report your results. Okay? <clears throat> Any questions so far? Yeah, for the yeah. example, 24 cube times 64. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, is uh, 64 is longer than 2 times L. Okay. Usually, we use the time direction 2 times L. So, I wonder whether it has any advantage. With the oh, you refer to out? Yeah. Uh, it does in the sense that we can sometimes, if it's too long, we can put two sources at the same time, at, at, uh, on the, uh, the same lattice. I see, two sources. Two sources then into double statistics. But then if you have the wall source or you have the noise on the same Wall source, thing, you cannot do that. Wall source, then you have a, if it's two, then you can have interference. Oh, okay. So, so you are saying the the about gauge the one one function, function or? or right. Like if it's too long, you can always take advantage by putting more sources on the one lattice. But sometimes, like a uh, very low pi on mass, pi on sometimes you need a very long lattice, depending on, um, uh, on the time. So it, is, it doesn't hurt to give you long time directions. Yeah, sure, but it takes longer time to compute. Yeah, 
I understand. Larger uh, lattice, okay, for stage uh, it's true. Simulation. When you come to here, it's really true. Sure. This is uh, uh, inevitable because yeah, the T has to be yeah, at least two times of the air. Right, right. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out how we do it. We cannot do this. Uh, this is going to be a challenge. It used to be that that when people can do the physical calculations, but without because dynamical fermion configuration generation is much more expensive. Now it has come to a time the generation of the configuration is faster than we can analyze it. So, uh, so these ensembles are already are already, already generated. How many configurations? I don't know how many. Maybe how many order order of two hundred or something. Just one mass, right? Because uh, just one mass. mass. All you need is physical. You don't need the other. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no sitting on the. Okay. You don't need a, a, extra okay. collision. You're sitting on the uh, physical biomass. So you don't need to do extra collisions. Uh -huh. Okay. So they already have a few hundred configurations. They have already a few hundred. We're just testing one. Even the 64 one. Even the 64. I don't know how many there are, but they are producing it. So they are really coming out very fast. And what's the Western winds? I don't know. Good question. Good question. I don't know. I don't know that. I don't know whether they know it because uh, they have not calculated, analyzed the meter, so uh, they may not know either. Okay. Uh, all right. So I just mentioned that to calculate the strangeness, that it involves. Uh, let me see if I can jump ahead a little bit. Oh, where does it go? Um, okay, let me jump ahead a little bit. Let me show you what they are. Okay. Okay, the thing is, when you do a, any, any um, UPM structure calculations, you have a piece which is called a connected surgeon, where you generate um, uh, a nucleon with a three part interpolation field and very, you know, a certain time t, and you let it go, and eventually you filter out the excited states, get a ground state of nucleon of the certain time, where there you include the, um, put the current on one of the part lines. And these are like valence like, and you go back to the to the vacuum later. But there's another set of diagrams that you need to calculate. These are called disconnectors, called connected insertions in the Green's function language. This is disconnected insertions. Uh, and the quark, this involves quark loops. It's basically, it's a vacuum polarization. Okay? Here, uh, we're not drawing any perturbative gluon lines because the gluon gauge, we're working on the gluon gauge background field. So the gluons are everywhere. So we calculate this thing. And the blue of uh, uh, lines are everywhere, so you cannot draw them. Uh, but this involves a, uh, a self contraction, which is harder, uh, because this one is relatively easier. You can come from one point to use some translational invariant properties from one space time point, you get all the space time for inversion of a large matrix. So all you point, you have a 10 million by 10 million matrix, all you need is color spin, 12 of them, put it in one space point, and you do inversion with the 12 columns. Here, because you have to go back to the space time point, then you calculate every space time point, which you don't know how to do. You don't have enough resources. Remember, this is a 10 million by 10 million matrix. You have to invert at least tens of million, uh, tens of thousands of times. We don't have the computer resources to do that. So we have to do the like a noise estimator to, to estimate this. This is basically usually two orders of magnitude more expensive than this one. I'll come back to this. So this is the for the strangeness because. The, UK has a U, U, and D doesn't have strange in it, so the strangeness and charminess comes from this part. That's why it's harder, to, much harder to calculate than the connected insertion. Okay, let's go back to the. Uh, all right, the first thing we did is improve the nucleon correlator. As I said, there's a nucleon correlator, there's a loop, right? Now, the nucleon correlator, what people usually do is put a point source and calculate all the propagators. Now here, and this is what the, when you look at the effective mass, it was, remember the, the uh, propagator has the e to the minus energy, the mass times t, so this is taking the log of that, so you can look at the function of m, and divide by t out, so at larger time it should come to a plateau, and that's where the lowest state, that's where you look for the, uh, the ground state of the nucleon, this is in this region, they show up. But when the, the point source gives you a blue point, so the error bar is this large, okay? Now, what we do now is improving this, the uh, situation by putting on the grid, on the source instead of one point, we'll put 64 points on this and put a Z3 noise on it to 
was using one. And do a propagator here. Now if you look, why the, the three quarks are not coming from the same point, they average out to zero. The gauge invariance will kill it. And also the Z3, Z3 is such that only three, three of them multiplied together give you so each of them, say, I2 pi over three, right? So all three of them together, then you get one coming back. So only the quark mass starting from here give you uh, 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 one from here, but you can also have three of them coming out here, three of them coming over here. So in principle, you can have 64 times statistics, ideally, but in fact, we don't get that many. We get something like here. We reduce the error bar by a factor of uh, three. That means we gain something like it, nine times the statistics. Well, one, same inversion, same time of inversion. Now, on top of this, we can smear this all thing, like a Gaussian gauge is very smearing, that improves this by another factor of two or so. So all together, and do if I do a point and smear variation, I can get another 10, or I get another factor of two. But we just stop here, for because this will involve additional uh, complications uh, to variation. So we just stopped here. With this already, you can see again a factor of seven times in error bars, therefore 50 times in statistics, with the same amount of computer time, same inversion. So this is really helpful. For the, for the disconnectors, for the loop, now we have the low modes. Somehow we have the low modes. The low modes, you can, you can estimate, using the estimate only on the high modes. And the low modes will have the wave functions. You can construct the, uh, the, uh, the loop from the low modes, which is just a linear sum, right? Because of a loop, of the low modes and high modes, one can just sum them over. And the low modes, we don't need to do noise estimator. And you can see the effect of this. Okay, the, the signal that we're looking for is the slope. The matrix element here is constant plus that times the t. t is the nuclear time. All right, so we're looking for the slope. Here you can see after slice times 6, there's a slope coming out. This is after the nuclei emerges. So you can see from here, previous ones. You can see from here, after, roughly after 6, this is roughly flattens out. This is where the nuclei shows up. Okay? So I have that, and starting from here, it's consistent that it, uh, the nucleon shows up, and that's where we take the slope, okay? Now, this slope, I can decompose that into the, a, 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 a low modes and high modes. Okay, as I said, low modes, there's no noise estimator, okay? Because in principle, you need a large number of, of noise. In principle, here, infinite number of noise to get exact results, right? But in practice, people use hundreds of noise. Here, we use only 48. But luckily, you can see the high modes contribution is very small, so almost flat, We're looking for a slope. So most of the contribution is coming from the low modes. And the low modes, we don't have noise estimator for that. It's exact. That's why it's very efficient. That's why we get a five sigma sigma. This result in a five sigma sigma. This is me going uh, just put it on, on, on the web. <clears throat> right? And compare. So this is how we got this thing here. So compared to the other people's calculations, right? This is this is quantity that cosmologists and a lot of people are paying quite a bit of attention on the strange discontent on it. And you can see that this is a whole lot of other calculations. One thing I would like to hide, this is our calculation, okay, with the five sigma. You can see that um, the FTS turns out to be only three percent. It's very small. Right? Therefore, the heavy quark turns out to be more important than the strange. This is small. <clears throat> now, but nevertheless, we can see the error bar, the, the statistical, this is a, the blue one's a statistical error, uh, the red is total, which includes statistical and, and systematic. As I said, we'll include the systematics when we have three lattices that continue, uh, carry that continue power limit. But at this stage, you can see our, our, our statistics is the smallest, even though our lattice is much more expensive to calculate than many of them. Okay? Now, let's highlight two things. Engelhardt, Used um, uh, domain one, domain wall for me on the stagger for me else. So his valence calculation is domain wall, and the JLQCD uses the overlap. So in principle, in the Fermi out, as far as computer time for each inversion, we are comparable. Now let's look at statistics. Okay, we used 176 configurations and 48 noises each. This calculation. Engelhardt used 468 configuration, a thousand. 1,200 noises, yet his error bar is still much larger than ours. So if you take these numbers into it, you multiply together, 
we are 60 times more efficient than this calculation. The reason is that we improve the nuclear correlator and we improve the, uh, the loop by looking at low mode average. Okay. You also have the time dilution. Dilute. Time in, for the loop. For the loop. For the loop. I have time dilution. Yeah. But but time for the connected. I'm uh, sorry. For the connected. No, this is the loop part. Only the loop part. Yeah. For the for the correlator for the nucleon, then we have the grids. Well, we have the grids with a normal substitution for the for the for the three low ones. And compared to the Japanese calculation JLQZ, they use this configuration, this number of noises. Of course, the error bar is larger, but compared to error bars and so on, we are like 12 times more efficient than theirs. Even though they also use the normal substitute, normal averaging, so their loop in principle is as good as ours, but we improved on the loop here. So you can see that, that in our case, we really have a big advantage in that computing this. This quality. And also, the other companies we are working on. Questions so far? So, compared with uh, JLQC, you say the uh, uh, the nucleon improvement actually makes such a big difference? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. We, 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 I, did, I don't know whether you've seen this, the plot that we have, where with the same computer time, we, we improve the statistic by a factor of 50. 50, 50. Now, this is a little, not trivial. Our 100 configurations, like 200, is like a 10,000. It's not a trivial improvement. <clears throat> okay. Now, for the heavy quark, nobody has seen the heavy quark before for the charm, and we were the first one to see it. Now, in your mind, uh, the uh, heavy quark, when you do the heavy quark expansion to leading order, at least to, to leading order, uh, heavy quark, and people use them to trace out, then it gives you the uh, GMU square, so you contract the loop, and that you can use the uh, trace anomaly to figure out how much that is from nuclear mass. Uh, and there, it looks like the matrix element should fall off like one over the quark mass, and modify the quark mass to it, and it becomes what looks like a constant. So we can check whether this is true. It turns out, when we calculate this as a function of the quark mass, it does seem to fall off. Now, whether it's exactly one over m or not, we don't know. When we calculate the, 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 the you know, multiply the quark mass to it and divide it by the nuclear mass, you can see this is a U and D and strange, then you start to flatten out. Even at a time where it's about 500, 500 or 600 MeV, you start, the error bar is still large, but it does have a tendency to, to flatten out. So this is a little strange. Why would you know, 500 or 600 MeV quark is just a little beyond the strange quark, and that is already heavy. If this if this trend continues on, okay. Well, but this is the first time anybody has seen this. Okay, for the heavy part, as I said, this will have the slope that we could look at. Slope gives us this 94 plus minus 31 m, three per, three sigma effects. The uh, compared to the uh, heavy quark expansion and the, the trace anomaly, Schiffman and company got something like 70. M. But the other people's improvement, but basically it's this. So it's consistent with this thing here. But we would like to improve the statistics to at least five sigma. <clears throat> you can see this thing is different from from the um, uh, from the strange. Here the char mass is much heavier than the strange. The strange case you see the low mode almost dominating everything. Here it does not seem to be the case. Low mode is still important, about half, but the, the high mode is also relatively important because the quark mass is really heavy. So to do to improve this thing, what we can do is just just get more noises. So far we have only 40, 48 noises. We can modify, you know, 10 times, get 10 times statistics. It doesn't cost that much time because the converting only the heavy quark is, is relatively is very quick, very quick. So we can relatively easy to control this, say, by reduce this error bar by a factor of say three or so, and then should that we should get 20% um, uh, error bars. Okay, so that should be um, maybe a problem that we can that we'll work on. Yes, uh, I think the, the I mean in the C corp, okay, that it does not have the charm, right? The C doesn't have the charm. Yeah, so yeah. if you include a charm, say mm -hmm. that means two plus C. one plus one. Uh, uh, I mean dynamical configurations, then uh, both with the, I mean, the contribution. 
Uh, I cannot estimate it uh, very precisely, but yeah. people usually think it's very small. Correction, me, my yeah, but since you are dealing with the CC bar, and then that might has a big effect, right? Yeah. Uh, but most if it's the CC yeah. bar on the on the C, okay, you yeah. have the SS bar, okay, then the C in the uh, I mean the charm in the C may not be that important, but then since you are looking at CC bar, then. Okay. Um, well, of course, one has to to see it, but um, people. Oh, the DeMille group has done to uh -huh. some of two plus one plus Did one. They measure not this one, not this quantity, but but their their statement is that's hardly any, any, any. Yeah, there is something uh, seems seems to be is, is, one must have to see the effect of the of the. Uh, it, it will be worthwhile to see it. I mean, at there must be some quantity. Okay, there could be. It has it has see it has see when you have knowledge. Yeah, yeah, it has see. It has see will definitely yeah. have some impact. The others I'm not sure. Ammonium and all these things. Yeah. The side by side, this one people fit in the model sense. In the model sense, you can think of this as the following. Okay, I have a I have a quark condensate right everywhere. Okay, that's like consider what is a meson. Meson on barrier is probably have a C, that, you know, really is water C, and the barrier or meson is like a bubble with a, with a with the power symmetry restored phase in this. So it's a bubble in this. So as far as the CC bar is concerned, I have one thing very intuitive picture. So I have a condensate everywhere, which is negative. Condensate is negative, right? Then you drill a hole with a bubble, making a bubble of this thing, right? In a the vacuum, therefore, you have certain volume, right? And then therefore, therefore, this thing minus negative quantity <laughs> becomes positive. So the C bar C and S bar S is positive. And how large that is, depending on what the volume is, roughly, the size of the meson, size of the variance. If you take that picture, because I know it's very crude, very, very um, somewhat intuitive, that that size of the of chromium or size of nuclei will not be affected hardly, will hardly be affected by the presence of the charm uh, in the sea. That's what I mean. Charm the nuclear. Charm in the nuclear. Charm, not in your charm in the in the vacuum. The charm in the vacuum. No, I'm saying you replace the nuclear by by charm the berry. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, this, okay, well, well, we'll wait for your results. <laughs> we'll wait for your results. Let's see, can you, can you translate your result for this is by CC bar into the probability of finding this, this is bar cluster and CC bar cluster in the nuclear? Uh, CC bar, and what do you mean by CC bar and SS bar cluster? Uh, SS bar, many people think that they the cluster inside nuclear. For example, could be could be spin equal to zero or to one. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Vector or so on. Yeah, that's. It will be spin will be one and that will be five. Right. 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 Sure. Sure. Can you translate that? Your result. Uh, it's lattice. It's hard to. Well, you can make models to explain, but here it's just a calculation, like you're doing experiments. Get a measurement. You get a number. You know you're you're doing right. But to have a very have a picture is, is what you rely on the specific models, like the model I, I gave. It may not be right or may not be precise. But you need sort of models to to relate that. The lattice give you a number. A number. How how is that related uh, to? You can look at the quark masses. You can look at other uh, power properties. But uh, compared to power relation theory, to Go from there to match all the models. As, uh, I don't know how to prove it. I don't know whether to prove whether there are clusters or not clusters. But there are certainly five quark components. I mean, five, yeah. seven, nine yeah. com yeah. quark in, 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 in the, the yeah. nuclear for sure. Yeah. So but here is the, the probability of this. Five right, quark. right. But that will that will require a uh, Fox phase decomposition, yeah. and that will require a Hamiltonian approach. Here we're doing a Lagrangian. So I can interpret the phase shift fields, I can calculate matrix element, but I cannot tell you how many uh, components, three quark, how many quark, you know, four and one quark, you know, five and two and nine quarks. I don't have a fox phase decomposition for that. Because then you help people to get the data. Yeah, true, true. But that program has started by, you know, um, what's uh, Hans Christian Pauli, not Hans Christian, and, uh, and Brodsky many years ago tried Lycone Hamiltonian. 